This careers blog explores the journey that Pagamile Shazo has traveled in her career, the challenges that women in tourism face, the role that technology places in the advancement of careers within the industry pertaining particularly to women and how she integrates her personal work as well as her family life to achieve this success. Hi, Paka. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. So, I mean, let's get straight into it. Um, what is it about the tourism industry that ignites your passion? And when did you decide to get into this business? Sure. So it used to be travel itself. I was definitely inspired <laughs> by um, experiencing different destinations, experiencing um, the ways that different cultures live around the world and the different ways of approaches to life. You know, um, I've always been a, a very experiential traveler. I've always been a backpacker or stayed in youth hostels and things. And you just get to meet so many different people that way. Um, and so those types of experiences are what I wanted to share with other people. I wanted other regular South Africans to have those types of experiences because they're very enriching experiences. They're very transformational experiences. Um, and then, yeah, um, thankfully that passion kind of collided with my entrepreneurial interests and over time developed into a business. Um, when I say over time, when I came back to South Africa full-time in, in 2014, um, at the end of 2014, I carried on traveling and I just started getting so many questions around where I was going, how I was affording to travel so much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but through that, I then learned where the gaps are in the current tourism value chain and where the opportunities are for, for young people. And then I think during that process or over the process of now being a business owner in the tourism sector, what now drives me is, is the truly transformational potential of the sector. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those, those sectors that has really low barriers to entry. You don't need a master's degree, you don't need a PhD, you don't even need an honors degree. Like it's very, it's, it's very easy for someone who has the right kind of tools to get up and going in this kind of sector. So um, in a country like ours, obviously um, those types of opportunities are really, really quite important. Um, a, that people be aware of them, B, that the government knows what to do with them, um, really to help and try and fix our situation. So that alignment between passion and business also now aligns with my purpose, which is to make a difference. And it's all one big thing, yeah. really. <laughs> and I mean, having, having extensively traveled yourself, what gaps particularly were you seeing um, within the um, the South African and African context, um, and what gaps did you want to close? So um, I think before I left the country for the first time, our, our idea of travel was very, and I mean, back then we didn't have social media. I mean, when mm. I left the country the first time, MySpace was just taking off, you know? <laughs> um, yes, back in the MySpace days, I'm that old. Um, but we didn't know a lot about what it is to travel, okay? Mm -hmm. So we were guided by magazines, or we saw in magazines, or sometimes on TV, obviously. Um, and so our idea of travel was a very conditioned one. It wasn't based on personal experience or the personal experiences of people we knew um, as regular young South Africans. And so when I, when I got to the UK and I started engaging with young people from all over the world and seeing how they traveled, you stay at like the most basic places. It's not about staying at the fanciest hotel in the biggest city in the world. Um, it's about connections. It's about building relationships. It's about engaging with the desk. There's just so much more that if you've never had the experience yourself, you won't know because you don't see that depth when you're looking at something on TV, at a destination on TV. And so initially, and also, sorry, and also I mentioned that I came back home full time at the end of 2014. And I remember for my 30th birthday um, in 2015, I did like this month long um, trip, Euro trip on my own. And what I was doing is I was meeting up with friends from business school. I wasn't staying in fancy hotels. I wasn't like breaking the bank. I was 
all the experiences that were part of my itinerary were experiences that I was really keen on doing and therefore had saved up for. But the rest of it was meeting up with friends and, and going out for drinks and just experiencing the city and stay and going to experience a rooftop swimming pool, like basic stuff, but that really gets you immersed in a destination. And so by then I had quite a few people following me on Instagram and I didn't want for people to think that that kind of experience is only available to you if you are in Europe, because mm -hmm. I knew already by then that that would be a false assumption. I didn't want people to think, African people to think, oh, what do we need to aspire to be traveling Europe? You know, we don't, we, we sure we can. However, our own countries, our neighboring countries just have so much to offer. And, and that's, that's the gap that I was filling immediately. That was the immediate gap to say, hey guys, so before we can all save up and start stock files to go to Europe, how about we start, Jay, you know, let's go to the Berg, let's go to the Free State, let's go to Limpopo. We live in a beautiful country, you know, and then let's go to Mozambique. And so by the end of 2018, we were in Mozambique every week with a group of young South Africans. And that's, that's how much there was of a need for that type of experience for young people. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you started Zulu Nomad way back in around, I think, 2015, 2016, I started seeing this movement, and it was a movement, um, yeah. because every other day you were traveling to some African country with a group of people, and you guys yeah. looked so happy and so blissful. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it was so special. It was just truly so special. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it because I'm, get, I'm getting goosebumps because of the, <laughs> of the, the Instagram pictures I would see. <laughs> yeah, like you know, we we had and it was young women. It was our, our target market, or and it wasn't people we went up and target. These are the people that mm. were drawn to bread and drawn to these types of experiences. Young women, young professionals, 21 to 42, and we just go out and have these extremely enriching experiences whether we're yeah. doing yoga out um, in the morning in the free states they're looking out over the mountains or road tripping through Botswana and like, bumping into a herd of elephants it was just truly truly amazing and 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 that's what really I think what still definitely drives me because even now now being involved in like the bigger value chain discussions that industry just discussions and forums um, it is a lot different it's, it's it's really not the same I'm not hosting experiences anymore that joy of of traveling every <laughs> week and, and meeting new people it's 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 completely gone but because I know that that's our source you know that's where we come mm. from we want, we want all people to experience that and ultimately we want more hosts, we want more guides, we want more storytellers to be available to host all of these young people that are just yearning for this tourism product that really mm -hmm. is struggling to find room for itself currently in the tourism sector. And so I mean, you, us, yeah. you mentioned that um, you, you're not hosting anymore. Where are you now? And, and you know, how has that journey been to get to where you are now? And what were the obstacles that you faced when kind of establishing yourself and starting out um, to where you are right now? So where we are now, I'm, I'm so incredibly proud. We fully pivoted into a technology enabled service provider in the tourism industry. And how that's come about is like I said, in 2018, like at our peak, we're in Mozambique every week and the experiences were so popular, the brand was so popular. So we knew that we needed now to secure funding in order to scale. So I'd been self-funding the business through my corporate consulting gigs and things in between. Um, sorry, when I say gigs, I mean strategic change projects. So around nine month projects, 12 month projects, but yeah. in corporate. Right? And then I was using my salary really to fund the business. But it came to a point where we now needed to secure funding in order to scale. And I really struggled with that. Okay. Um, I'm good at a lot of things. I'm not good at, at raising funding. <laughs> I'll, I'll Same here. Same here. So, <laughs> so, um, 
we then came across an opportunity with booking.com. It's called the Booking Booster Program. And they, I work with startups and incubate you, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is like um, late 2018. And I just knew I had to go for this opportunity because there was so little funding going around, you know? So I applied for the program. I could tell through the process that they were very keen, you know, on this product. It's a woman owned business. It's African, it's fresh. We're coming up with new experiences. Um, long story short, we didn't make it into that program and I wanted to die because I was so sure we were going to be in. <laughs> but um, after taking a bit of a breather, I then had to reflect and say, okay, what is it that we missed? You know, and I went back and I looked at the feedback and it was all around the innovation. And I was, I was still like, no, but this is so great. Nobody else in the market is doing this, <laughs> you know? You don't have other mm. like safari companies or big tour companies trying to get young Africans to travel the continent. So this is innovative, but I had to, you know, give it space to actually sit and land. And, and that's what I did. And that's how I then ended up at a conference in Bangkok in July of 2019 where um, it's, it's called the Arrival Conference. It's an international conference for destinations, right? And that's where I came across some really, really incredible startups, um, German startups, American startups, a few Asian startups as well. That year, I mean, at that conference, I got to engage with the founders of Get Your Guide who had just mm. raised 500 million US dollars for their marketplace. Um, yeah. Some of the key speakers were from Kluk, also an Asian startup that had raised 500 million US dollars that year in Destiny, in tours and attractions. Mm. And, and it was just this immersive, again, um, look into the solutions, the technology enabled solutions that startups in the rest of the world were developing and that were getting funded. And that's when the penny dropped to say, okay, this is what they mean by innovation. <laughs> you know, so I came back home, um, regrouped and thankfully, remember that corporate work that I mentioned that I was doing in that line of work as a change management consultant and over the years that had evolved into uh, managing digital transformation projects. So I know how to get um, a solution developed even though I'm not a technical person myself. I know how to facilitate that process. Um, and so I started looking at that. Okay, how do we build a local marketplace that's going to connect travelers with this awesome tourism product that we know for a fact already exists, right? Because mm. um, now we know we've traveled 35,000 kilometers of this continent by road. And so we know in every country we went to, we had an amazing experience. We had a great place to stay. We had good food. Um, we had good music. We had amazing mm. hosts. Right. So then, it's like it then get it then becomes a case of connecting the people to the actual Absolutely. technology Absolutely. now. Because this because the perception is that no, the product doesn't exist. You know, you just go to Africa for safaris or yeah. like if you're old, <laughs> you know, but the, but that is a fault. Perception. The product does exist and it's an exceptional product. It's just mm. that people don't know about it. So then we went about looking at how do we use technology to make, to bring this product to the fore and connect travelers who are looking for authentic, immersive experiences mm. on the continent with the suppliers of this tourism product who more often than not are communities who are in the most rural of places with not much infrastructure. They just kind of traditionally kind of just are along the way of the big safari companies and therefore we'll get a client here and there. It's not people going to them intentionally, which is what we had started now doing because we built those relationships. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that if we're able to use technology to connect these two parties, then we're, we're onto something great. And that's exactly what we, we've been working on <laughs> yeah. since then. Um, but at the same time, and I know you're gonna ask me questions about about this, um, but it speaks to what we're doing now and where we are now is that fine, now we've built this world-class marketplace and there's it's a full-on booking management system and communications and payments online, but the fact still remains that the, the communities or your supplier at the, end, at the other end is not ready to onboard themselves and take these amazing pictures that they're going to put on Instagram and Facebook and tell people to come and book on your platform. Yeah. We're not there. 
you know. So the, the UNWTO World Bank has the latest report on women in tourism. Um, and Sierra Leone found that only 19% or 16% of women owned enterprises were using email to communicate with guests. So, and again, because we've had that operational experience, we know that this is going to be the case in several African countries, a majority of African countries. So what use is there in having this platform that people are actually not going to be able to use effectively to make the most of it, which is being able to generate revenue online. And so a lot of the work that we're doing now is building up that ecosystem that's going to make sure that these business owners that we're putting onto the marketplace are supported in terms of the skills that they need um, either for themselves or again um, training pe young people around them to come in and fill these roles that are really desperately required in the tourism sector. Mm. And you know what is then the impact of you said this was a 2018-2019 um, kind of planning or um, 2017, mm. 20, 2018, 2019, <laughs> then COVID hits. What then is the impact of COVID in all of this and getting things moving? It's It's been absolutely devastating, hey? Um, and, and in the true sense of the word, I mean, in, when, when COVID hit March, 2020, I was in a WhatsApp group with a bunch of speakers on my way to Berlin and I was gonna be like, <laughs> putting up the marketplace there and crowdfunding the thing because now I knew I couldn't get funding right so I had this plan that you know millennials all over the world are going to help us fund and we're going to build this market yeah all the whole thing just fell apart um but again I think understanding the gap between this ideal of this platform this marketplace that we want to build and deliver in the market and where the market actually is and now through this COVID period the real um, problems or the day-to-day -day challenges that small business owners are going through in the tourism sector um, and again our ability to leverage technology to solve certain problems we decided to to shift our focus a little bit and so um, June, July 2020, we already had our online learning platform up um, and that learning platform initially we had um, developed, <clears throat> we developed the custom training on um, the COVID-19 protocols, which were developed by the Tourism Business Council of South Africa and the Department of Tourism. And we took those and we digitized them, put them on the platform and we gave it out for business owners to train for free. And we had about almost 70 business owners take that training, you know, and give us feedback. And, and so we started using that time to, to build relationships within the sector. We started using that time to engage with these business owners, right? Because if I give you free training, now I've got your email address, I can send you a little survey. How are you doing actually? What are you missing in your business? What is going to help you recover quickest, you know? Um, because again, from our experience, sure, there's going to be relief funding, but who ends up receiving that money? What does it end up going towards? What are the actual needs of business owners in the, in the market? Um, that's what we wanted to understand. And so that's what we started using the COVID period um, for, really showing the industry or showing the tourism sector what is possible to do when leveraging technology and trying to solve some of these smaller challenges that we can that are manageable to be solved with very little <laughs> money um, to go around, um, but which are adding incredible value um, in the tourism sector. So right now, I think that platform is the only platform that we can say for sure how many tourism mm -hmm. businesses have been trained on the COVID-19 protocols in all of South Africa right? Yeah. Um, so it's really been around showing the industry the value that we can create, you know, for the entire value chain. Um, so that when things do recover, we are able to, you know, you're not now coming out of nowhere and people don't know who you are and you want them to just come into your marketplace. It's a lot, it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to service the tourism industry as a technology enabler. Can people still enroll in this or is it closed for now? Um, if it's closed, when when will you open oh, up more enrollments? 
Yeah, so we've got two training programs that are currently available on the Zulu Nomad um, training platform. So it's that COVID-19 protocols one. It is absolutely free. Business owners can please, especially your mama who own our BNBs, um, please go on there, take the training for free. Um, it, is ready, it is still available. And then the second one we have, uh, which we developed again a little later into 2020, but um, also online, also for free currently, um, is the Tourism 101 for Experiences Entrepreneurs. Because the research, the studies show like conclusively that the tourism product that attracted a traveler in the 60s, 70s, 90s, even early 2000s when they're coming to the African continent is not the same as the tourism product that a millennial or a Gen Z mm. traveler is looking for. And therefore we have created this online course that is going to take a young person through that process of understanding, okay, what is a food tour? Like, where do I start yeah. if I want to create a food tour? What is a walking tour? How do people make money from free walking tours? You know, all over the world, you've got people making money from free walking tours. How does that actually work? What is it, you know? Um, how can we leverage our history? How can we start using our ability to tell our stories, to generate an income for ourselves and create this new tourism product that is desperately needed in the market right now? And so, um, those are the two training courses that are available um, on the Zulu Nomad learning management um, platform at the moment. Amazing. And I mean, how do you over time? Awesome. How do you then adapt to the different cultural norms that we deal with and the language barriers that we have when doing business across the African continent? How do you address those, you know, th those delicate things and those nuances and the, the changes yeah. in, 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 in the way that... Um, Business here is done differently than business in Sierra Leone. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think um, what, what's definitely helped for myself is just that strong foundation in terms of being able to build relationships with African people um, from a younger age, right? So when I left South Africa at the age of 20 and went to the UK, um, I was at business school and for the first time, in my life, I, I engaged with people from Gabon and Gambia. I didn't even know there was, I'm embarrassed, but I didn't know there was a country called Gambia, you know. <laughs> and I had and I had folks from Gambia in my in my business school class. And and so really, even even in fact, one of the the the, the biggest sort of uh, mindset shifts mindset shifts for myself from that experience was. Nigerians, right? And I, I wrote a little post about this on my Facebook a couple of years ago to say, you know, our conditioning around how we view each other as African people has, has its sources, there's reasons behind all of these things. Mm -hmm. And unless I had picked myself up from Durban, from Ibria, and my understanding of what a Nigerian person looks like or does or, you know, is, and I had not had that opportunity to be plonked out of there and dropped into a cosmopolitan city in the United Kingdom where you've got young people from, from all over Nigeria, a country yeah. with like 400 million people. Um, it, it became a little joke in, uh, on campus that I was, I was scared of Nigerians when I arrived on campus, right? But mm. had I not had that experience, I would never have had the opportunity to learn um, and understand and appreciate African people for whom we all are, and we are all very different. Um, and, and I'm very appreciative of that. So again, when I lived in Shanghai, um, we had um, the biggest, in fact, African community that I've lived in outside of South Africa. And there you've got the Anglophone, you've got the Lusophone, you've got uh, Francophone um, countries represented and so in meetings with a whole bunch of African people, we'd all speak Mandarin because that would be the common language. <laughs> right? And so um, just, just having those types of experiences outside of now I want to do business with you um, really has created that foundation in my life for being able to engage um, across cultures, across the borders on the African continent. And it is very important. I think South Africans 
um, <clears throat> tend to not be so well aware of ourselves, especially on the rest of the continent. Um, and, and so it is, it is something that definitely, I believe, works to my advantage. And then obviously the other one is, uh, uh, thankfully, um, didn't stop studying French after high school. I have studied <laughs> French since high school religiously. Um, and that definitely helps as well. Mm, being multilingual, multicultural, um, being able to just bond with people and get to know people beyond what your perceptions are. And that, that's extremely Absolutely. important. Yeah. I mean, Africa is deemed to be one of the fastest growing regions for 5G as well. Um, according to the 2019 Ericsson Mobility Report, um, the, our digital divide still looms, though. Um, how is Zulu Nomad and in Africa able to also strategically operate digitally when the majority of Africans still face that digital challenge? You mentioned earlier how Umama, who's running that tourism business, in Gambia or in mm. Gabon or in Sierra Leone, probably won't have that digital access, won't be able to take those photos um, and, and get their stuff uploaded mm. onto the platform. But how are you bridging that divide? And how do you see the growth path um, in terms of business digitally growing in Africa? In, in fact, you're going too far because umama ola imtata, umama osengutu, umama ola imaseru. They you know what's so funny? funny. I, was looking, I was looking for holiday destinations and I want to take my family to Etinza. But I know that mm. Etinza, you have to drive there and go to yeah. a, probably a local guest house and knock on the door to be able to find mm -hmm. a nice, comfortable guest house that is close mm -hmm. to the beach, that is well connected, that is in the community. Yeah. It's so hard to find yeah. something on a platform like a booking.com. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, for us, we, we have now proven um, the case for this tourism product, A, and B, we know for a fact that as far as millennials are concerned and millennials traveling, if you're not online, you are irrelevant, right? And so it is really in the country's best interest to make sure that every single tourism product owner is online and is visible online. And so again, we have, we have chosen to pursue the solutions that are within our means in terms of developing and putting out there, but we, absolutely rely on partnerships um, mm. and opportunities for collaboration with your telcos. All of the telcos are right now um, definitely focusing on increasing, especially here in South Africa, increasing connectivity in the rural areas. Coupled with that, we should make sure that, okay, so if I know that Vodacom is going to be installing a tower in that little town, I need to be there next month uploading suppliers of tourism product onto the marketplace because now they're going to be connected. Um, we are from a skills, per, from a skills point of view, um, collaborating and working with your Digify Africa to make sure that the digital skills training that is available currently for free through Digify Africa is able to reach or mama in the rural areas as well. We, mm. we are um, having a training session with Digify Africa on the 27th of September. Um, mm. It is free um, for tourism business owners for specifically this purpose. Um, we are looking at, in fact, we are now in September launching a campaign called Let's Innovate Tourism and Hospitality. And the aim of the campaign is to do exactly that, to highlight to the owners of technology solutions. So you've got your guys who do accounting software, provide accounting software, HR payroll software, um, marketing services, um, data, connectivity, fiber, all of that. Whatever services that I as a business owner need to thrive and to and generate revenue in the digital economy, I need to be able to understand A, what that product is, how it fits in, and then get upskilled in terms of how to actually apply it in my business and to then have someone make sure that I am actually applying it effectively so that we're able to create and grow the ecosystem. So 
what we're doing is really looking at, because now we understand the gaps, partnering and collaborating with as many of um, the more established players in the market who can come in and actually add real value while also obviously generating revenue for themselves at the same time. Mm. And can we say that, you know, when it comes to also women's advancements, um, it can be accelerated through more ownership, through more skills um, upliftment, through more access. Um, I'm a huge believer in you don't know what you don't know. And I think in most Mm. cases, we have women sitting in these labor positions and are participating in terms of labor in in the regions of tourism and in spaces like tourism and on shifting into ownership and into leadership roles Mm -hmm. because of the skills deficit. Mm. No, absolutely, Oluetu. So I think one of the the biggest groups, stakeholder groups that excites me in the tourism sector right now is actually probably all of the the women who've been retrenched through this COVID period. So you're Mm going to have a host, thousands of women who were employed in some role within the tourism value chain who are now sitting at home. That person has a wealth of knowledge as far as the operations um, around whatever part of the tourism value chain they're working within. You take this person and you partner them up with a digitally skilled young person or a software engineer or an entrepreneurial thinker and you coach this person around, okay, what was the biggest problem in your job when you were working there? Like, let's try and unpack that. When you start working on the solutions, there's just so much guys that we could be doing, right? And you're absolutely right. The tourism sector is one of those those sectors that employs a lot of women. Um, However, again, it's also one of those sectors that is actually made up of small businesses. So it's the same thing with uh, us trying to transform a mom and pop shop. Like, no, um, um, Becky over there isn't trying to have (laughs) some young black person come into his business. It's hardly enough for just him if we're being mm. honest, right? There aren't enough in the tourism sector, there aren't enough of these big giant corporates that we can come and transform. No, we're going to transform the tourism industry by, like you're saying, focusing on accelerating opportunities for young people and for women in this sector. And it is not impossible. It is definitely mm. possible to do. And with that means that we're going to have that focus and direction and actually want it done. Um, And so, uh, yeah, definitely opportunities for women do abound. Unfortunately, the realities of of our environment is that it is it is very difficult, you know, to Mm. to put yourself out there and be an entrepreneur. Um, I think some of the expectations around how what an entrepreneur should be doing and <laughs> it's so unrealistic when you consider the fact that I'm a 36 year old woman. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I've got a house. I've got bills. Mm. So realistically, also, um, sure, there's, there's these opportunities, but they need to be supported, and they need we need to find ways of people being um, properly supported through the early stages so that they can grow sustainable businesses. Absolutely. Um, what is the government doing to improve the plight of women in these industries? Um, are they doing enough? <laughs> so I will say that no, I do not think they're doing enough. Um, you know, they, they, there are funding programs all into these, the Tourism Transformation Fund, there's the Green Incentive Fund, there's now the Tourism Equity Fund. But all of these things somehow just miss the mark, right? Um, you know, we're not, without sharing anyone specific, but with the last round of the Tourism Transformation Fund, we have this WhatsApp group of young tourism business owners. Um, I went in and I was like, oh guys, who applied? How was it? Blah, blah, blah. And um, someone was like, you know, I went through the whole process. And they kept on wanting me to take a 30 million rand loan. Like, no, we don't want 30 million rand loans. <laughs> I'm looking for, you know, a 500,000 rand working mm-hmm. capital injection there, a 30,000 rand grant over there. Like the, the funds that are there are then inaccessible to us, if we're being frank. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not looking for 40 million rand to do these huge infrastructure projects. 
We are wanting funding solutions that are going to speak to our business needs and are going to be realistic for us. I'm sitting right now in a situation where someone, I need 600,000 Rand collateral. Where do I get 600,000 Rand collateral from? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but those are the types of interventions that are required. There is funding. However, it's mm. just missing the mark in terms of where we are as women um, and as women business owners in the tourism sector. Yeah. Um, emotions and experiences, um, they create memories when we're traveling. Um, how do you solve the solution and how um, and what kind of values do you apply or have you learned or have you taken away from traveling um, via Zulu Nomad in, in Africa? Um, you know, you, you mentioned that the, there's something that was important that you mentioned um, in the beginning that it's not about the big fancy hotels, it's about human connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not about having the most expensive experience, but it's about the connecting and seeing people and meeting people and creating mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of that um, idea of pinning dots on your map. And, and um, on your 30th, you went to Europe and you had this experience of reconnecting and meeting up with all these people that you've known from your travels. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you walk us through some of the values and some of the emotional experiences, um, some of the memories created um, and how you hope to advance this via Zulu Nomad and in Africa? So I think when, when I see, when I, when I look at the tourism sector, right? And, and to that question around the emotions and the memories, um, there is just so much potential in South Africa, guys. Um, we went from being this country that the entire world was rallying behind for our people to be free. Like, and it was a very emotive time, right? And then 1990 came and then 1994 came and we were free and everyone was so happy for us. And then we kind of just went on with our lives. Like, now we, we call them foreigners and we have these and it's not just african people right so so the entire world was mm -hmm. rallying around south africa that for me is a huge miss, missed opportunity as far as tourism because a lot of people all over the world played a very important role in our freedom and and not big, not of politicians and just regular folk, like people who's now in our generation, whose parents or grandparents would have, who would have attended marches or gotten arrested as well, you know, for standing up and saying something. So all of those people, the entire world that was rallying behind us, we haven't had that opportunity to connect with and to actually bring into our space and share our stories with them around what it was like being the person whose freedom that you, you out there were shouting about and being an activist for. Um, and just to, to tell people our stories. So, I mean, Oletu, when my, my favorite ex or my best experiences in Barakai, so Barakai Beach, one of the most beautiful beaches in the world, my, my most memorable experience in Baraka, I was actually just being with the family out in the mountains about 45 minutes outside of there, mm. where we walked through the rice fields and they told me about their lives as farmers over there. And they showed me how to cook using like the bamboo over the fire. And then we went into the little stone bath and it was just wonderful. We got back into our rickety old van and drove back to Baraka. So the memory we, we have, we have, this incredible country um, just on its own, um, each and every province in South Africa is stunning. There is a natural heritage there. It's a natural mm. asset that belongs to all of us as South Africans, right? And then on top of that, we've got our story. We've got our cultures. We've got 
I mean, one of the most exciting groups in South Africa, for me anyway, is colored people. And this idea that colored people are just all the same. No, like if you talk it's to so... <laughs> our, our Kulus, and you find out where did you actually come from? Like some came from Malaysia, some came from, I can't even say, I don't know, but I want to know, right? Mm -hmm. So these are all the opportunity. The best Indian food, or not even the the most in types of different types of Indian foods I've had, I had outside of South Africa, and I'm from Durban, like mm -hmm. that has the biggest community of Indian <laughs> people living outside of India. We don't celebrate our own diversity, and that is all just tourism product waiting to happen. Mm. Okay, and it is memories waiting to happen, and it is healing from trauma that is waiting to happen. Because the more we talk about our experiences during apartheid, which we haven't had an opportunity to, to do a proper one, um, the better we heal as a country and we acknowledge our past and we're able to move past it. And so, again, the, the technology, the platforms, they just facilitate you know, this process, they facilitate this growth, they facilitate all of this opportunity, all of these memories, um, all of this emotion, you know, and growth that potentially mm. then takes place. And, and it's, it's terribly exciting. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, I, I, I just, I can't wait to get onto um, the next trip or get onto the next flight and mm -hmm. head out. <laughs> ah. So excited. So, I mean, how do you marry your corporate life and and this, you know, love for traveling and this love for chasing adventure? Um, you you you're in, in your corporate position, you it's called a scrum master. You yeah. know, can you can you break that down for us and, and also just tell us how do you marry the two worlds together? Okay, so remember I said that I was always consulting, right? Um, so I've been consulting and, and back in the day, um, project implementation methodology that everyone was using was called a waterfall method, where you plan the entire project up front and then, and then you go and you implement according to that. Over time, that has evolved with the implementation of digital uh, projects where we now use the agile methodology and in the agile methodology way, a scrum master is essentially now someone who facilitates the implementation of digital projects, but in an iterative manner. So you don't plan for six months, you plan for two weeks at a time. Okay, mm. so that's just what a scrum master <laughs> is. Um, but again, I think for me, when I, when I set up and, and it, it's about being intentional, right? It was very intentional for me. Um, to not work in corporate full time. I made that decision about 10 years ago that when I realized that I, I didn't have the ambition to be a CEO or a CFO or, or C-suite level in any kind of corporate environment, I knew that I wanted to go out and build my own um, businesses. And so I structured my way, my life and my time in such a way that I'm still able to obviously use my skills within the corporate environment, but with the flexibility of being able to travel, um, like I said, when I'm between projects, or if I know I've got a quiet week, I'm going to plan my time and then take that time to travel. Um, and there's pros and cons, right, to, to this. It's just about being intentional about what it is that you want to do with your time and how you want to live your life. Um, and then now, unfortunately, with COVID-19, I definitely had to go back now to work full time, which is the, the, the space that I'm in now. And it has been difficult. It's been very difficult adjusting to full time employment after long 10 years of independent mm -hmm. consulting. Um, and, and I think in the types of in the type of role that I'm in as well, it is difficult for people who've been in corporates for 20, 25, 30 years doing things a certain way to now have to learn new ways of doing things and facilitating digital transformation initiatives. So it is very demanding. Um, however, um, again, I think knowing at the back of my mind 
just how big of an impact we're potentially able to have in thousands of lives through the work we do in the tourism sector. It's been quite important to still keep that work going. Um, however, at like gear two, as opposed to gear five. <laughs> so, so we've slowed right down. Um, mm. And knowing that obviously I do need to prioritize my corporate job um, at all times and make sure that I deliver on that. Um, and then come, comes the, the business or the tourism sector and the opportunities there. Um, but one of the first things that I did when I arrived within my, my full-time employment was to look at the strategy, like what is the business strategy? Where is the business going? And try and align that to where I want to be uh, myself, right? Because it's, it's um, maybe just a personality thing, but it becomes very difficult to just get involved in GA. Like yeah. Just, I'm <laughs> it's very hard for me to do. So it was quite important that I understand the strategy so that I can start thinking about, okay, and now this is me playing an entrepreneur role. So even where I am, I'm identifying opportunities daily for this business in the tourism mm. sector. Um, how do their products fit in into this merchant network that we're potentially building? What are the opportunities um, to add even more value than I was hired for within this space? Um, and so that, that's really how I've, I've balanced it um, in the last few months. It's, it's not easy though. Um, yeah. you're, you're, working. You're, you're also you're also a mom and a wife um yeah. there's you know <laughs> there's also trying to to manage that balance of family work yeah. and not allowing like the, the two things to kind of clash and you're you, you know you are in business and you traveled a lot with you were traveling mm -hmm. with your husband you know <laughs> baby yeah. was also traveling with you guys at some point and he, I mean he's a nomad baby now um how how do you manage that balance as well and and kind of you know strike that balance of we're doing this because it's kind of our bonding time as a family versus mm. this is now work mm. it's it's just been I, i'm incredibly blessed to have um married someone who values um that type of lifestyle so we are very adventurous as a family um, we enjoy experiential slow travel as a family. And so even when we're out somewhere um, or we plan, okay, we're actually going to, and this is now specifically during the COVID period, we can plan and say, okay, fine, next month we're going to work out of a cottage in, on the coast, right? And mm. we'll go there and we'll chill for a month. And um, sometimes we'll have baby with us sometimes baby will be off to Gogo and Kulu <laughs> or Gogo um, and, and so thankfully just being able to plan our lives again just being intentional about what we're doing with our time and how we're spending our time as a family um, has helped but definitely I think it, 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 it is difficult sort of putting that that balance to say okay what am I not going to do um, so um, I don't, initially when I started off, there was a lot of pressure to post, right? To just keep posting because that's what, that's the, the life mm. we were living before. Oh, it's a nomad, we we're out and we we're in a new place every week and we we're taking these amazing photos and writing these captions. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, you know? <laughs> so I had to then say, okay, no, I don't need to do this. I don't have time for it. I'm going to put this down for now you know, um, and, and focus rather on the business and the family and the such and such and such. And so it, it's always about that give and take um, and, and accepting help from those around you and being able to leverage on, on that support that you have, that support system in our families and our nannies, thankfully. <laughs> You're also a board member, um, a board committee co-chair rather of Access, Inclusivity and Diversity at the South African um, Tourism Association, SATSA. Can you tell us um, about the diversity issue? You touched on it earlier on um, in the tourism in the Southern, um, in, in the southern Africa region. Um, one of the things that we spoke about earlier was, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not as, complex as we make it out to be where 
women need or, or black people need to buy into these um, you know, this little tourism, don't don't you got was it's it's not that vibe. It's literally upskilling. What are some of the other diversity issues that we come across and, and we, we can pinpoint and see where the real pain points are in turning over and and, in, and having more inclusivity and diversity mm-hmm. in our tourism? So so again, I think I think it's it's a lot of stakeholders just speaking past each other. Um, and and maybe the government being so set in our tour in our sector triple B E E codes and everyone must stick to this and transform and for me again being more about what are we implementing today and where are the opportunities for young people and women in the tourism sector today my focus is very much on and has been very intentionally so about what we're doing at a grassroots level. What can we do? What are the little initiatives that we can start putting into the ecosystem? And so when the opportunity came um, for me to join SATSA at that level and and be co-chair of the the Access Inclusivity and Diversity Committee, for me, it was immediately an opportunity for us to use this platform um, to facilitate tangible outcomes in the tourism sector. And so our initial focus, again, I started, I started in that role um, in October last year. And our initial initiatives were really ge- ge- geared toward training and mentorship. And in the last couple of months, we have been piloting along with the Tourism Business Council of South Africa and the Department of Tourism, a mentorship program which um, I'm, I'm so in, like, yeah, which the Satsa community, um, when we made out the call, when we made the call for mentors, within 48 hours, we had mentors with over a thousand years of experience offer their mm. services to mentor up and coming people in the industry. For me, that's not something that people do like begrudgingly and like I have to force you and try and manipulate you and no like people were willing people came within 48 hours you know and so that for me speaks to where the other side is right the guys that we want to transform Uh, Mm -hmm. but maybe again it's just to say maybe we're not transforming them maybe we focus on transforming the sector you know by bringing in new tourism product and bringing in new skills within the sector to grow the the sector um, as opposed to transforming individuals or individual businesses Mm. but again that that may be controversial Um, (laughs) we're very excited about that that mentorship program it is a pilot it is national and um, right now we have 47 matched pairs between an experienced business and an up and coming business. And we're looking forward to seeing the outcomes of that, which would then be able to roll out nationally. The other one, a very exciting opportunity that we've been working on was with the Tourism Equity Fund. Again, um, I have been approached even before I joined Satsa by business owners who say to me, listen, I'm ready to retire, I'm tired, but I don't know where to find this young black person who's now gonna come in and buy into my business for us to take advantage of the Tourism Equity Fund. It's a very good idea. Business owners in the sector like it. For them, it is a good way out um, because they are ready to retire, a lot of people are, and they are wanting to have someone come in and take over the business you know, and sustainably hand over. But where do I start if I'm, again, in the middle of nowhere. Mm. I don't know where to find Oluetu, you know, and Oluetu doesn't know where to find me. Um, and so we then decided to run a proof of concept where we um, had a business owner in the Eastern Cape, owns a, a boutique hotel, beautiful, um, right on the beach. Um, and he approached us and said, listen, I actually want to hand over this business, but let's do, let's run it as a proof of concept. and and see if we can get access to the tourism equity fund and have the business either handed over to the staff or incoming um, young BE candidates. Um, And so unfortunately that stalled with the court case um, against the department, but that was an initiative that again, we saw lots of value in because you don't want someone to now be sitting there with this big tourism product or asset. Again, again, those Mm. things are, 
minimum of 10 million rand, you go in there as this young person, you've got the opportunity, you get the 10 million, you get the business, and then it sinks because you don't have yeah. the support. And so we wanted to make sure that people who are get, we, that go through our programs have the necessary support to build sustainable businesses. Um, and yeah, it's initiatives around training, um, training guides, training adventure guides, some of the work that's happening in the Eastern Cape as well at the moment is supporting homestay providers. So they've been supported through programs sponsored by um, the municipality, the district municipality down there, which is really, really great. Um, and then we have our SATSA colleagues handholding them through that process of, okay, how do we formalize ourselves? How do we now get involved in the tourism value chain and get access to these opportunities that come up? But a lot of the time you'll find that at a grassroots level, business owners are not compliant and therefore don't qualify for a lot of these things either. And so it's just been working at a grassroots, understanding what are the needs of communities, what are the needs of um, community-based tourism bodies as well and helping them through the process of getting formalized and, and really preparing ourselves for when the industry is ready to open up again once the pandemic is a bit under control. Yeah. And lastly, we're getting into tourism month in September. Um, what are some tips for us as South African travelers um, during this month? Definitely continue, please, observing the COVID-19 protocols, wear your masks, sanitize everywhere you go. Um, and, and if you come into an establishment and you see that hmm, these guys are not up to scratch as far as their protocols, please say something um, to someone. It is really that important. It may be that, and I think I've seen this in some of the smaller towns, because they haven't been impacted so much by COVID-19, they can be a little bit lax. And the imperative is then on you as the traveler to go, hey, guys, mm, I'm from Joburg, or I come from such and such a place. Please, you know, let's get the proper protocols um, observed. Um, and then, yeah, let's all just take care of ourselves out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate the steps that you are taking in the tourism business um, and ensuring that women lead in the tourism business and get the upskilling are accelerated, are revived during a time like this and can realize their full potential. Thank you so much, Paga. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Ole, too. And, and well done on this platform. I'm just so proud of you guys as well. Well done. Thank you.